Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we're well into day one of the fifth annual Global Education Conference. We're delighted that you're with us. We've had a really fun day, great first day. And George Saltzman is here. George, welcome. Hey, thanks so much. Glad to be here. Really delighted to have you here. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters. Iron USA, just a stalwart supporter for so many years now. Really appreciate all that they do for us. Global Campaign for Education, new as of last year, but also terrific support at Gregert and uh, providing lots of support and help as well besides the financial contribution. Lots of other good organizations there. We appreciate all of them and hope that you'll take time to check them out or visit with them. They're almost all presenting in some way. This is a chance for those of you who are in the live room to indicate where you're participating from. Click on the star or sun icon that's to the left of the map. You have to click on it twice, then click on the map. Put a shout out in the chat. We know that Tahiti is here. The not so glamorous Asheville, North Carolina, which is where I am. We've got Asia, we've got South America, Florida. Australia, wherever you are, we are sure glad that you're with us. Please keep those notes going in the chat, but we're going to move forward to give George as much time as possible. Dr. George Saltzman is an associate research professor in the Center for Doctoral Studies in Global Education Leadership at Lamar University. He's an Apple Distinguished Educator, Mobile Learning Policy Advisor to UNESCO, and winner of multiple awards, including Campus Technology Innovator of the Year, Blackboard Catalyst Award, and the New Media Consortium Center of Excellence Award. As a higher education consultant to numerous technology corporations and over 50 educational institutions, George routinely works to advance the effectiveness of technology and education. George, how have you and I not connected before? You know, that's a really great question. I was thinking that just the other day that uh, it's 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 almost amazing that I haven't hooked up with you yet. So anyway, how are you? It's great to meet you. Yes, nice to have you here. Thank you so much. We'll uh, we'll be here listening and watching and supporting in whatever we can. Well. Uh, Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, hola. It's really great to uh, it's really great to be with you today. I've got a uh, topic that I'm really interested in uh, to talk about today, which is global education. Um, the, the research that I'm presenting is the first time this has ever been presented, so this is all brand new. I hope that I have all my timings down and that uh, I have all of the right um, information that you're looking for. So I really like being interactive with uh, with this presentation. So feel free to talk into the uh, chat box there. Be able to type in whatever that you have questions with. You have comments. Be sure to put those in there. Love seeing that feedback. Sometimes uh, doing this at the uh, uh, the webinar way, you don't necessarily get to see the audience feedback. And I'd, I'd love to I'd love to see that down in the, in the uh, in the chat box, if you will. So um, I'm going to get moving, talking about uh, preparing leaders for global education. What are the kinds of things that we need to do to prepare global leaders who can work in education around the world? Um, as I mentioned before, uh, and thanks for the introduction, my name is George Saltzman. I put uh, two little dots here on my map. Uh, I put those there because I live in Abilene, Texas, which is a little blue dot there. And I work in Beaumont, Texas, which is a little red dot there. They're both in Texas, but it's about uh, 420 miles apart, or uh, I, don't know, I guess that's about 670 kilometers. I go down about once a month to meet face to face. The rest of the time, my colleagues and I from around the world in the Center for Doctoral Studies and Global Education Leadership work remotely, like what we're doing today. So. Um, um, moving on along from the introduction. So when we're thinking about global, um, you know, we think about these interconnections that we have between each other and all the, all the different ways in which, in which we are connected. Um, this is sort of a photo, I guess it's not sort of, it is a photo of um, the connections that exist on the Internet and how we interact with each other and 
um, I think about how does that uh, how does that connectivity that we now have affect education? And to sort of set the stage for this, I like to uh, I like to kind of go back in time a little bit and and kind of reset. Um, a little bit about some of our experiences that we probably have experienced just within our lifetimes, or maybe your parents. Um, I don't know about you, when um, uh, Australia just fell off the edge of the earth there. I'm sorry about that, Carol. Um, you know, it's a it's a square presentation and it's a widescreen world. <laughs> um, so I don't know about you, but when I was growing up in uh, in my part of the world, here in North America, in the United States, when I was a teenager, we had what we call the party line. It was a telephone that was shared with four other households. And we, uh, we had our special little world of, of how you had different rings that would be for different people. And so the phone would ring, and you'd have to listen, is that my ring, or is that the ring for the people down the street? And you might be more interested in uh, picking up a phone call to call somebody, but you'd pick up the phone, and you'd realize that your neighbor across the street was on the phone, and you, know, you had your polite way that you would hang up, and you know that was kind of that was kind of an interesting thing. We never really thought much about that. Um, that was just the way that telecommunications worked, and and for a big part of the developed world, um, getting access to a telephone was a pretty big deal. Um, my mom um, would tell me about the time when they first got the telephone, and um, you know the the. The kinds of impressions that she had about uh, calling long distance. You know, you got to be very careful about thinking about what you want to say so that you can minimize the cost of the phone call. And mom, we haven't been paying for long distance in decades, but you know, that's just part of uh, that's just part of the world that we grew up in. So, let me take you a little bit further forward. Um, I don't know about I don't know about you, but has anyone else heard of Eric Whitaker? Um, Eric Whitaker is a he's a Grammy-winning composer. Um, he does a lot of work with choral and orchestral and uh, wind ensemble music, and he does exactly the virtual choir. Um, the virtual choir is an amazing thing, and it it started off um, innocently enough in 2011. A, a, a young girl recorded herself singing some of his work and sent it to him, and he thought, "This is amazing! I'm getting feedback from the people who listen to my music. This is great." Um, how could we make this better? So he came up with this idea of doing this virtual choir. And and when it started in 2011, he, he put out a call for people who wanted to participate. He had 185 people from around the world come together um, from 12 different countries and 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 sing together. And he would he he uh, filmed himself um, orchestrating. And they filmed themselves singing. They had all the pieces and parts. Yes, exactly. Thanks for the YouTube, Jackie. I wanted to uh, wanted to play a little bit of that here, but I was worried about the bandwidth. Um, and it, before long, he ended up with millions of views. The, the first one in 2011 got four and a half million views, is what YouTube is saying right now. He decided to expand that. Later in 2012, um, he brings up Water Night and and gets. Almost 4,000 participants from 73 countries, um, a million views right off the bat. People who are coming together from all over the world who are participating together in this virtual choir. Um, it culminates in 2013 with this project called Fly to Paradise. It has just shy of 6,000 people. Um, from 101 different countries from around the world. They, they didn't know how to be able to put everybody on the screen at one time. So they came up with this idea of having these buildings, these city, um, these city blocks. And each of these buildings has windows. And each of those windows is a video of a person performing. And it's, it's amazingly orchestrated. You have, you have 6,000 voices coming together from 101 different countries to sing the song. Um, it was it was uh, launched at the coronation festival for the uh, for the queen at Buckingham Palace in 2013. I mean, when could it, when could you think about living anywhere in 101 different countries and being able to, as an amateur, being able to perform with a Grammy award-winning composer for the queen in the coronation festival at Buckingham Palace? That's an, an amazing event that happened in human history, and it 
it just illustrates this type of connectivity, this type of globalization, the impact that the world is coming together. When I hear these songs, I just get chills up my spine because I think about what an amazing event this is to have all of these people from humanity coming together and work on that. Um, here's another example. This is, uh, this is from the world of science. So in academics, um, this has been a, an interesting phenomenon that's happened over the last few years. Um, researchers had been trying for decades to fold the protein of, of a virus that's very closely related to AIDS. And um, helping, um, helping in this process, they enlisted some of the greatest supercomputers that they could get access to. They had been running this software, this Rosetta software, for decades, 24-7, 365. They were just running and running and running. And uh, they couldn't figure out how to fold this extremely complex protein together. Well, um, somebody came up with an idea at the University of Washington that the best way to solve this would be able to turn it into a game. So they created a game called Fold It. Anybody heard of Fold It before? Um, it, uh, it brought together people, and the people would, uh, real people would get together, and they would, they would look at the puzzle in front of them, present it as a game, and they would try to solve that puzzle. Um, they would work on teams, they would have small breakthroughs, they would get the dead ends, and they would, they would talk about this, and they would post all this together in the, in the bulletin boards of the, of the game. And um, something amazing happened. What, had, what researchers and, and the, highest, um, the highest qualified biomedical experts in the world using the most sophisticated computing machinery for decades hadn't been able to do was solved in three weeks using the Foldit game. Um, and there's a very interesting thing. If, if you're from academics like I am, you, you know, you read a lot of journal articles. Um, the, the journal article that was published in Nature actually listed at the end of the, at the, end of the author's, um, in the attribution uh, page, listed 57,000 players of the game asking or thanking them for their, uh, for their uh, feedback and their gameplay to be able to help solve this problem. Um, this this uh, folded has gone on to, to um, um, solve many other uh, interesting biomedical challenges. It's, it's actually um, taking care of one of the world's greatest problems, which is thinking about um, how to solve the, the AIDS problem. Um, very interesting, very interesting point in time. Thanks again, Barbara, for uh, for being able to put that up there. Really appreciate you guys filling that in. Um, this is uh, this is an interesting guy. This is Bruce Hudson from Midland, Ontario, in Canada. Um, he was a former groundskeeper and log home builder. Uh, he ended up with a stroke and was put on disability. Had some time around the house, so he spent his time working um, with NASA and their citizen scientist program called the Stardust program. Um, this is a, 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 a probe that went up into space. It collected, it collected dust particles in the solar wind, brought those back, and, and, and asked people to be able to help find that. So Bruce Hudson, a, a citizen scientist, goes down in human history as the first person to ever discover something that originated outside our solar system. Um, but he was able to He's able to uh, use the data that was put out there, working with others, um, was able to find this speck of dust. That's really um, more impressive to think about finding a speck of dust in the entire universe. That, that makes needle in a haystack sound like a, uh, like a very overkill kind of statement. Um, this, is, uh, this is the type of things that are happening in the world today, right? Um, we find that people are coming together. Data um, is able to move anywhere across the world. People are able to find each other, be able to work in teams. Um, this is this idea of globalization. So let me put a little bit of background around uh, the study of global education leadership. And to do that, I think we need to talk a little bit more about what globalization is in general. Um, there was a uh, there was a uh, kind of a, uh, I guess, a fundamental article that was released in 2001 by Van Dam, and he was talking about what were the effects of globalization in education. And he boiled that down into six ways that, that he saw globalization affecting education. Uh, the first of those was the rise of the network society. Um, this is a bit of what we already talked about in, in some kind of this intro, thinking about Eric Whitaker and his virtual choir or Fold It, where, where um, people are coming together through the network and, and, and creating these communities. 
Um, an interesting thing is happening around this idea of network society. Um, in, the, in the latest uh, research that came out in 2012, um, this was uh, a study that demonstrated now that 85% of the entire global population is now connected through email or similar digital technologies. 85% of the world can connect to each other through email. That's, that's almost unprecedented in our ability to be able to find each other and to be able to interact. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the picture that I put up here, 75% of all United States five-year-olds are proficient ICT users. 75% of kids are already proficient in using ICT before they ever get to kindergarten. It's, it really is the Netflix generation, isn't it? Um, when we think about um, when we think about learning and early childhood learning, 30% of all children now learn to read using a digital device. They're they're sitting with their parents and and they have digital devices up in front of them and they're using these interactive tools to be able to learn to read. Um, it's a part of the way that that children are learning and and working. Um, if you look at what older kids are doing, right? Um, as they're playing online games, especially uh, especially males like to play uh, massive um, massive online games, and um, an interesting phenomenon happens there. A majority of those people who are playing those games interact with somebody internationally, and many of them create international collaborations and teams to be able to work together to be able to, to solve these games. Um, because the world uh, is awake at some point, uh, I can hand over part of my team's responsibility to somebody in Australia. They can hand it over to somebody in Tahiti. Um, the sun would never set on our game playing empire, and that's just the way that that uh, that they function, right? That's that's what happens. Um, let's go on and and think about the second way that globalization has affected education. Um, this is the kind of restructuring of the world economic system. Uh, between 1950 and 2007, international trade expanded at about 10% a year. Um, it's it's, it's a, a very large expansion in trade. Um, by 2007, we kind of hit the uh, a little dip in the road as we had the, the latest kind of global um, recession. But by 2012, the World Trade Organization estimated that um, the amount of international trade that's going back and forth between each other sits at about $36.7 trillion. Um, it, it dwarfs the gross national product of the United States. Um, international trade is by far the largest um, GNP of any entity out there, and education is being brought up into this restructuring of the world economic system. Um, a lot of the types of things that that um, are being created for education are being created for this education market. We'll talk about that just a little bit more later on. Um, the, the third way that globalization is sort of reshaping the world around us is thinking about the politics and the post-Cold War system. Um, uh, before, in the Cold War, about one-third of the population lived in Eastern Bloc countries. Those countries didn't participate with Western Bloc countries. Those economies functioned very separately. Um, and we lived in a world that had multiple economic systems. After the Cold War ended, those, economics, those economies merged into one. And for the first time in all human history, there was a single economy. Um, that was truly global. I mean, with the exception of Cuba or North Korea, pretty much we're all one interconnected economy that, that's related to each other. So when one depression hits in one part of the world, it's felt around the rest of the world. Um, this has opened up education markets. Um, we, we share freely. This, uh, this conference is a great example of that. Um, we have people from all over the world who are coming together and, and interested in a common in a common goal and in a common idea. Um, oops, I was behind on my slide. I'm sorry about that. There's a, there's a picture of the G20 leaders. There's a great little photo. Somebody took it from the side, and Vladimir Putin is very far off to the left. And um, whenever it was taken from the side, it almost looks like he's standing completely by himself, which was, I thought, an interesting, um, an interesting commentary of some of the world politics today. OK, uh, moving along, thinking about uh, thinking about how mobile the world has become. Um, just in physical movements, we see that uh, uh, we, we, we see an 
what is it, uh, one billion people, according to the United Nations World Travel Organization, one billion people traveled internationally in 2012, highest number ever recorded. Um, and if we look at how many people are telecommuting, teletraveling, like what you are right now, um, that number is absolutely staggering. Um, I know when I first graduated from college back in 1990, um, one of the very first jobs that I had was health community in Africa. I was working in Uganda. We were putting the newspaper online. We were getting the information online. Um, it was just a part of what we could do because we were connected together through this, through this technology. Um, even though that the technology wasn't widespread, um, it, it did allow us to be able to, to uh, move the type of information that we needed to to be able to disseminate that around the world. Um, that type of activity now seems commonplace. I just I mentioned to you earlier, um, I live 420 miles away from my job. I telecommute every day. I, my, my peers telecommute every day. My students telecommute every day. I'm presenting by you by telecommuting. It's, it's part of what's happening. Um, if we look at if we look at how this has really affected our social networks, the the connectivity that that really extends into society, we notice that about 50% of the U.S. population is on Facebook weekly. Um, there are 250 million photos uploaded to Facebook every day. Um, this is a place in which we notice a lot of activity going on. Um, American adults. Um, uh, this is kind of an interesting number. 11% of all Americans, regardless of age, uh, in 18 or above, regardless of age, have used some sort of a dating app. 38% of those who are single and looking um, are using dating sites regularly. Um, over 60% of Americans think that online dating is a good way to meet people. Um, how would that have ever happened? How would that have ever been conceived before, before this idea of this virtual mobility where we would go on a date without ever actually meeting each other? Um, interesting world. Uh, let's think about, just for a moment, this idea of this erosion of the nation state, because this is what really is playing into a lot of what's happening in, in global education as, as we know it. Um, before, education was largely in the domain of a very specific organization, right? Um, this was something that happened at, uh, at a state level or at a national level. You had a Ministry of Education. Ministry of Education was responsible for the education within that country. Um, it was largely driven by that country's goals, by that country's um, um, economic needs. And that has begun to change. We start to see that, that there are some, some universal education needs that are preeminating all of the, the, um, the different economies and, and different political systems. In fact, um, that is, that's very true when we're looking at what's happening in, in some of the technology pieces. So um, uh, laws, copyright law, is something that has now gone well beyond any, anybody's collective ability to um, um, control that within within a border. Um, we have these things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, they, um, trying to figure out how do we solve this, this copyright issue at a global scale. Um, companies like Apple, uh, <laughs> who are figuring out how do you art, how do you outsmart the local tax codes by uh, moving their money around internationally. Um, this is a this is a very interesting phenomenon that's going on uh, as we see sort of the idea of a nation state going down and these sort of sub communities being brought up. Um, the the sixth and final um, way that Van Dam believed that globalization was affecting education was in this ability uh, that we're seeing of these complex cultural developments that are happening across the world as we're, we're sort of coming together into this amalgamated culture. Um, what's, what's driving that is telecommunications, um, whether that's through, through multi, um, uh, um, through mass communication methods like television and radio, or that's through individual uh, communication methods like like telephone calls and text messages. But um, the International, Tele International Telecommunications Union mentioned that there are now 6.8 billion mobile cellular subscribers on the planet. Um, in almost every part of the world, everyone who is capable of having a phone 
has some sort of device. That doesn't mean that they have minutes to use it, but they have some sort of connectivity. And, and this is really profound, because really, for the first time in all of human history, humanity is connected. Our, our friend here on the plains of Africa could use his phone to call the President of the United States, the Queen of England. He could, he could uh, get a hold of Vladimir Putin and ask him for his horse riding advice. There's nothing that this person can't do if he has the appropriate network. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's something that's truly amazing. And, and the ability for that person to be able to reach out and to be able to find information, to be able to gather the information that that uh, that he needs to be able to solve the problems that he has is is changing how the the uh, value proposition of education is seen by people all over the world, and that has that's uh, changing the way that we're viewing what the what the value of education is. So uh, I'm going to skip uh, beyond thinking about globalization in a broad way and come in and talk about it very specifically in some of the phenomena that we've seen happen within education. Um, probably one of, the, one of the most dramatic is happening with the Bologna process in Europe. Um, as, the, as Europe came together to form the, the European Union, there was this idea that higher education needed to be exchangeable between countries of the European Union. The Bologna process was put in place to be able to make that happen. Um, and it is radically changing how the nation states of Europe are thinking about the, how, uh, about the process of their higher education systems. Their higher education systems are having to merge together. Um, they're having to figure out how they become interconnected when, when they weren't interconnected before. Um, we're also seeing these, these types of things take place outside of Europe. Education City in Doha, for instance. Uh, many, many different higher education, uh, higher education institutions from around the world coming together and, and being um, co-located in a single place for people to, uh, to come together. Texas A&M, um, supported by, uh, by the state of Texas, has a campus in Doha. Um, how, does that, how does that affect what the mission of Texas A&M Doha is? How does that affect what they perceive as their, um, their stakeholders? How does that change the way in which a, an executive who's working in a higher education system has to think about being prepared for understanding how to manage and, and lead a truly global university. Um, let, me, uh, let me shift and think a little bit about K-12. Um, in K-12, we don't necessarily see uh, students traveling from all over the world to attend different uh, schools. Usually they attend the school that's closest to them. But what happens in the school is taking a radical shift. Um, we see them um, bringing the outside world into the classroom with virtual field trips, and we also see them taking the classroom into the rest of the world, where students are, are participating with other classrooms on the other side of the world. Amazing types of interactions that uh, allow them to be able to co-work on projects together, um, be able to have international partnerships as they're creating objects and solving problems and thinking about, uh, thinking about how they fit into the world system. Uh, migration is happening at a, at a record pace around the world. It is very common now for many classrooms to have multiple languages spoken. Um, when, I, when I was in school, I think that uh, there might have been two or three people in the entire high school who knew how to speak Spanish natively. Um, that same school now has about six different languages spoken. I know that uh, from my peers, it's very common to have as many as 20 or 30 languages spoken in, in metropolitan areas where there is a lot of immigration that's going on. Um, that type of, that type of um, outside connection coming in, or the, the type of the world coming into the classroom has profound changes in the way that we think about, about the culture of the classroom, what is the culture of the stakeholders that we're serving in education, what are the needs of the people who we are serving in education, and that, uh, that means that even a principal in a small rural school is still going to have many different international and, and global um, experiences that they need to manage and understand and, and help provide a education that will serve the needs of those constituents. So um, now, that's not just thinking about 
um, what's going on in K-12 and high ed. It's also thinking about how this is working with international organizations, NGOs, and other uh, government organizations like UNESCO. Um, obviously, if you work at UNESCO, you need to understand how global how education is working in a global way, how global education is building out. Um, we think about uh, like NGOs, uh, 10 by 10 and, and the Girl Rising campaign, which is an amazing experience to uh, try to help understand and, and create opportunities for girls around the world who would have not necessarily participated in education before. The people who lead those organizations definitely need to understand um, what's going on in, in global education. Um, the the curricula, uh, the materials that we use, have become much, much more global. Uh, in the United States, I know that there is a big push now where we're using the Chinese math curriculum in a number of different schools. Um, the textbooks that we publish are, are typically exported globally. Um, a textbook in biochemistry isn't just done for a single geographical or political region. That textbook is pushed globally. Um, the types of apps and, and um, Interactive content that are being connected, uh, that are being built and put on the world, are connecting people from all over. Um, that is something that is is um, is growing and increasing. So, um, a textbook publisher, a textbook author, a person who's putting curriculum together can't just think about how is this going to serve the person that's in my local school district, but how is this going to serve people across the nation and across the world, because that is truly a global audience in which for, in, for which they're writing. Um, you think about technology devices themselves. Um, this is this is one of the interesting things about traveling internationally is when when um, you would go to a different country there was there was the telephones were always a little bit different um, what what a phone book looked like in London was different than what a phone book looked or a phone booth looked like in New York City um, the the type of telephone that was on my uh, nightstand in a in a hotel in Paris looked different than what a telephone would look like in India. Those were those were little nuances about how those devices were built within those within those cultures, and and they had affordances of those cultures. Well, when we look at an iPhone or an iPad or any type of a tablet device, uh, an LG phone that's coming from South Korea, um, those devices are pretty much the same the world over. There's not a lot of difference. A, an iPod that was created in the United States, um, designed in the United States, built in China, and shipped to Japan is, is going to be the exact exact same thing that was being shipped to Nairobi, that was being shipped to Dubai, that was being shipped to London. Um, people who are working in technology and building the tools, the hardware for education, are having to think about how this works in a global way as well. Um, obviously, we know that there are a lot of um, in, in a, a lot of interesting resources that have come out in the last few years, these open educational resources that have been designed for the world at large. Um, let's create open educational resources so that they can be used around the world. Um, the Khan Academy is an awesome resource. Um, everybody around the world is using pieces of the Khan Academy. You can't understand um, what what you need to do to make the most effective videos for the Khan Academy if you don't understand the global audience in which you're reaching. How do you lead an organization like Khan Academy without having some understanding about global education as a whole? So that provides a little bit of the background. Um, now, what is it? What What are the competencies? What are the skills, the traits, the, the pieces of knowledge that you need as a global education leader to be most effective. Those of us who are in higher education who are thinking about training global education leaders, we had to stop and say, what were the things that, that make a global education leader a global education leader? Um, what are the types of things that are different than what we would have typically done with a domestic education leader or a regional education leader? Those, uh, those are very significant challenges. So um, what the study did is the study went out to the literature and uh, looked at five, well, looked at almost 100 individual competency studies in global leadership. Um, out of those, uh, we were able to find 522 
previously validated competencies that have been proven through empirical research um, to be be the valid competencies for global educators. Um, we looked at that and we said that is an enormous amount of competencies. Are all 522 of those are, are those going to apply to global education leaders? We also went out to the education leadership uh, literature, looked at two or looked at uh, I guess it was 23 studies. Out of those 23 studies, we were able to find 239 empirically validated competencies just for education leadership. Uh, we looked at those and we said, okay, so how many of those apply for global education leaders? We don't know. Um, we pulled all of those together into about 750 individual competencies. We clustered those into 61 competency categories. Um, we were able to find some duplications that were between global education and education leadership. Um, we were able to, I'm sorry, between global leadership and education leadership, um, we were able to uh, combine some of those that were very similar together into the 61 unique competency categories. Um, we, needed a, uh, we needed a body of people to validate those competencies to be able to tell us yes or no. Um, we as researchers might have an opinion, but our opinions shouldn't count as much as people um, who represent the world at large. So we took that to UNESCO. Um, we had 47 participants um, in the study who came from 36 different countries, and we asked them to come to consensus on the appropriateness of these education leadership competencies for global education leadership. Um, with those, um, the, uh, the number of countries that participated are listed here. We had um, very good participation across the United Nations geopolitical regional groups. Um, these just weren't all Western countries or um, sub-Saharan African countries. These uh, were represented from at least 12% of all member states in each of the United Nations geopolitical regional groups. Um, that, felt, uh, that felt very good that we had a, a body, a panel of people who could represent the world at large when they were responding to these studies. So um, this is the way that the process works. I won't go into much detail here, but just to like, give you an understanding of sort of how this evolved. Uh, we began with the 761 competencies that were found from the, the uh, from the global leadership and the education leadership literature. Those were combined into a uh, meta-analysis. That meta-analysis um, worked that down to the 61 competencies that I told you before. Um, we also asked the UNESCO affiliated panelists if there were competencies that they believed were important that were not listed in the 61 that were um, combined and distilled from the literature, they suggested an additional 35 competencies that they believed that were important but were not represented from the existing literature. Those, pan those uh, panelists were presented with all 96 competencies and they went through multiple rounds, three rounds of consensus finding to find agreement on which of those competencies they that were, were really valid. Um, 51 of the competencies from the literature, 19 competencies that were suggested from the panelists were found to reach consensus. Consensus was set at 75% agreement. Uh, and that 75% of all of the countries participating had to agree that those competencies were valid. And those um, were combined into the 70 essential competencies for global education leaders. So um, um, violating every rule for how to create a slide, here are the results of all of the 70 global education leadership competencies shoved onto one slide. Um, I know that that's got to be almost impossible to read. Hopefully that you can see it. Um, but these were, uh, these were the competencies that were found. Uh, we did a second round in which we asked them to ordinarily rank which of the competencies are most important. Um, those are listed in the ordinal ranking of importance. The most important competency for a global education leader is vision followed by leadership, followed by integrity, um, and you can go down the list there. Well, still at 70, um, that was a little bit hard to, to kind of get our arms around. What exactly, how do, how do we take 
this and make anything of it. Um, one of the ways that, that uh, we thought to contrast what we found by was looking at what was rejected. Um, so these, uh, this slide lists the competencies which were not considered essential. Um, it's not to say that the, that the panel didn't believe that these were important. All of these except one ranked positively. Every, uh, they all had some level of agreement, but we couldn't reach a 75% consensus level with these competencies. The only one that had any uh, negative on it was belief in God. You, uh, from, from a global perspective, you do not need to believe in God to be an education leader, um, but um, all of these others would be somewhat um, important for you, even if they didn't reach consensus. So let's put that into, um, into some uh, analysis where we can kind of boil this down into, into larger movements that, that can be actionable by you and others who are thinking about becoming global education leaders or preparing global education leaders or, or managing the global education leaders that are already a part of your organization. Um, by far, the generic leadership skills were more highly valued than anything else. Um, vision, leadership, integrity were the ones that came up first. These are not unique to education. These are things that come from general leadership. Um, these would be, these are very prominently found in the global education leadership literature. They're very prominently found in education leadership literature. So a leader still needs to be a leader, and we still need to practice good leadership development. That was one of the, that was one of the conclusions that we were able to reach from the study. Going on, um, we were looking at competencies that were specific to business were rejected. And for a, for a study in global education leadership, um, this felt OK. Um, we don't need people who understand global capitalism, who under have business savvy, or who are entrepreneurial, um, at, at least entrepreneurial in the way of starting business. What we're looking for is people who understand education. So um, that, that was a, a validation that uh, we were able to sort of sift through the, uh, the, the most important and least important parts of what were coming out of the literature. Um, in that, there was less interest in, in managerial focus competencies than there were for ones um, that were more that were more generic, even when those managerial focus competencies were education specific. For instance, um, deep knowledge of the global education agenda, while it reached consensus, it ranks very low on the ordinal ranking. Academic administration, understanding of comparative education. Um, those don't rank nearly as highly as some of the some of the more generic skills like vision. So, what that tells us is um, that from a global education leadership uh, focused panel, what they believed is that that leadership skills in general were more specific than the actual details. Um, the belief in that is that the actual details can be learned where. Um, uh, a, a good leader could be able to pick those up and be able to move those forward where uh, a person who didn't have the overall leadership categories wouldn't be able to move, uh, wouldn't be able to advance as fast. Um, and another kind of interesting trend that, that showed up is competencies that are often referred to as sort of 21st century competencies or 21st century skills tend to be ranked higher than those that were more content centric. Um, it, it's more important for a global education leader to be able to think creatively, to be able to solve problems, to be adaptable. Um, those, are the, those are the types of things that are highly valued by people who are working in, in the highest levels of, of, uh, of global education, at least within UNESCO and, and the, the countries that are part of the member states of UNESCO. The, the, Content-centric skills, having um, those very domain-specific things about education ranked lower. So um, that, uh, that has some very interesting ramifications for what we think about, especially in formal education leadership prep courses. Um, when, we looked at, uh, when we looked at the data, looked at those, those 70 competencies that came out, um, 
these competencies that we would call global citizenship competencies were very important. The, the ability to have a global mindset, to be able to have social adaptability, to have empathy for others, um, the, the ability to, to see others um, from their perspective ranked very, very high, where interpersonal competencies um, were not um, as high, but still um, but still higher than the domain-specific competencies that we mentioned earlier. So um, if, if we looked at the characteristics of what an ideal global leader would be, um, they would be someone that has a global mindset, that social adaptability, the ability to cope with stress, open-mindedness, uh, the being sincere and honest and truthful, having that integrity. Those are the types of things that, um, that were in the top half of the 70 competencies when they were ranked. So. Um, very, very interesting data, at least from a researcher's perspective. So trying to bring all of this together, what, um, what are the lessons that we can learn for preparing global education leaders or being global education leaders? Well, for, for um, universities, when we looked at the types of things that, that are in most education leadership development curricula at universities, um, we saw a disconnect. We saw a mismatch, which was what was which which what was happening in those programs, which is what was being recommended by those in the global education leadership community. Um, we needed to spend more time emphasizing problem solving and adaptability, and and to be able to be agile and on your on your on your feet thinker than those who are able to be rote um, rote um, responders of pre-digested curricula in which we fed them and, and we wanted them to feed back to us. So when we, when we think about those 21st century skills that we're just trying to impair in students, um, that's something that we also need to do at the doctoral level of global education leadership preparation programs as well. Um, when we're looking at how organizations are working with their talent development program, um, many of the talent development programs are focused on on domain knowledge. What are the things that, 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 that you need to do in your organization to be able to manage the day-to-day -day tasks of your organization? Um, the literature was fairly clear that organizations should be putting more emphasis on those general leadership skills, creating really good leaders with integrity who, who are able to think agilely over having a person who is a good manager. Um, the, the types of management styles that work in one area or another are going to be different. That was one of the great findings from the GLOBE um, study, is that uh, different parts of the world, different cultures are going to have um, different markers about uh, how they respond and how they work together in, in a culture. Um, we need people who can be able to see those things and be able to adapt to those things rather than trying to push a single management style or to be able to uh, um, be able to push some of those more content specific things towards them. So um, overall, if we're thinking about what we're trying to do for everyone in global education leadership, uh, we, we would love to see develop, we love to see us develop more of those global interpersonal competencies. We don't have enough of those. Um, even people who have worked in global education leadership for 25 or 35 years would say that they are still learning what it means to be a global citizen. They're still um, needing to um, learn how to interact with people who they haven't interacted before. Um, well, how do you do that? Well, um, one of the best ways to do that is to do it. We just need to get out there and we need to do more. We need to find more conferences like this to participate in. We need to find more opportunities to work on projects together, to work on collaborative grants, to be able to find collaborative teams that, that we could participate with. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to find those people who are outside of our our, our globe-focused area and, and work with people who may have something that, that interpersonal traits that look very different than ours on the globe study, um, on the globe study list of, of competencies. Um, what, uh, um, what can we do in, in education to prepare better leaders to lead global 
Lee to lead global education. Um, I, th I really think we've got to work for bringing in more collaborative opportunities to, to, to focus on more opportunities to engage our students in education leadership in the United States with those who might be working in South America or in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, places that, that uh, feel very different in the way that they think about uh, the purpose of education and, and the, how education is funded or how education is, is uh, run through the, through the political system. So um, that's a summary of uh, of a lot of work to understand what makes a good good a good <laughs> I'm sorry about the the stuttering there what uh, what makes a good global education leader um, it uh, it was a lot of work to be able to get to that point but I think we at least have a list of competencies that are validated um, that have been proven globally that allow us to to be able to think very carefully about the types of training programs that we're putting together for people in our doctoral program and, and to assist others as they're building out doctoral programs as well. So um, um, it's a little esoteric. Um, we've talked a lot about data. We've talked a little bit about application. We don't have a lot of of, of implementation to be able to show you that this is working yet, um, but hopefully this is the beginning of the dissemination of that knowledge and that you will go out and help create the next generation of global education leaders who can bring the world of tomorrow um, to the world today. So thank you. Um, if you have questions, I would be more than happy to take those. You can put your questions in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand, and we'll give you the microphone. Oh, Kathy, you said great content. How are we publishing and sharing this? Um, this study is um, being um, published as an open education resource. Um, hopefully, it will be published to UNESCO, and we'll be able to know that very soon. Um, if it's not published to UNESCO, I'm more than happy to give you a copy of it um, as soon as we get it completely ready for publication. Um, we've got the, the research was completed about uh, two months ago. I think we've got all the data crunched and, and all of our analysis done. Uh, we've just got to be able to get that into a format that's digestible to most people who don't want to read 450 pages of, of, uh, of text. Um, Yes, uh, very recent. Um, uh, the study only began in uh, February. It took us between February and the summer to run through the multiple rounds. Um, as I mentioned before, there were a number of, of high-ranking UNESCO delegates. Uh, most of those have the rank of ambassador. We also ask uh, employees in UNESCO education sector. Um, and we also ask people who are part of the UNESCO's affiliated schools network um, to participate in that. So that got us uh, a good connection of people who are focused on, on K-12 and are focused on higher ed. Um, it uh, is the, the first study that we can find anywhere in the literature that's focused on the idea of preparing global education leaders. So that was, uh, that was a, a, a kind of a, uh, a feel-good moment to know that uh, this is something that had never really been done before. Um, yeah, I would love to see um, others. I'm looking at uh, you're talking about seeing those uh, in alternative education excelling those areas as well. Absolutely. Um, um, you know, we we think about how the global education community comes together. It takes teachers, it takes curriculum, it takes devices, it takes systems, um, it takes funding. All of those things have to work in harmony. We all have to be focused on the same outcomes. And this was uh, this is one of those ways in which we thought uh, maybe we could uh, um, help bring some focus on what those outcomes should be. Um, I'm uh, trying to keep up with the chats as they're coming in. Um, uh, I'm looking at, uh, at Laurel. I've been providing uh, 
I've been providing great resources for years for our district. High school teachers have short periods and restraints with new standards. If you're working with these teachers, how would you work with them? Um, I, um, I always think at the, at the top level down and from the bottom level up, I would start at the top level down to say, um, I, think we need to, I think we need to reconsider what those standards are based on what the needs are um, globally. And then I would start at the bottom up to say, um, um, every teacher needs to be a global education leader. They're, they are working with a microcosm of the globe and in their classrooms. Um, that is becoming more and more international every year. Um, that, um, that takes a, a much bigger understanding about what it means to be a global citizen, how citizens of the world um, are similar and how they're different, and um, what, are the, uh, what are the goals and purposes that those that those kids need, what are the skills and, and um, knowledge that those kids are going to need to be able to work in a very global world. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Compass is K-12 parents who are concerned about the race to nowhere. Does it start at the top? Uh, down from colleges emphasizing more of this. <clears throat> wow. Um, great question or great comment. Um, um, <laughs> I, uh, without getting too political, um, I do think that the education system, as it's understood by politicians and the education system as it's understood by parents, is different than how the education system is being understood by business and other organizations. We're feeling a bit of a dichotomy about this. Education um, is feeling um, a bit of pull. Um, we, we uh, in higher education in the United States now have to uh, we have to be able to show that uh, everyone who is graduating is getting a job. Um, so that is a very marked shift from education being the, from the ability to um, become a better person, to become a more knowledgeable person, to become a more rounded person, to being an employed person. Um, we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of shift going on there. I I think it's going to take a a a large um, conversation at a global level to talk about what are the needs of educators, um, what are the, the needs of education, and what are the needs of students, and how we go about preparing education systems and educators in those systems to prepare our students for the world. Um, no, Toastmasters International has not featured my study. Uh, if you want to make a recommendation, I would love to send it over to them. I, I do see, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of connections between the fundamentals of what Toastmasters um, believes and what was validated in, the, in this study. Um, uh, I made a project with the UNESCO. I took part of European projects, organizations are not connected. It's a shame. And you know that um, um, that's very true. Um, we still have not reached what I would consider to be a world of global education. I think, do believe that UNESCO is trying to create a global education world. Um, I think that uh, the Europeans and what are coming out of the Bologna process, we're very focused on, on what that means within that European region. I think we're seeing some of the same kinds of connectivity that are happening in the English-speaking world. Um, there's a little bit of an agreement about uh, commonalities within, within the kind of, I guess, uh, Australian, New Zealand, UK, Canada, US, um, part of uh, the region about how we're thinking similarly. We get a lot of a cross-pollination of ideas. Sir Ken Robinson has probably spoken more in the United States than he has in his home in the UK. Um, but we've got to be, we've got to find ways to get the governments more connected through um, organizations, be that UNESCO or somewhere, uh, some other type of organization. I see it happening in higher education more at the, at the discipline level, um, where, where um, international musicians are getting together to think about what the curriculum looks like for music, or where international mathematicians are getting together to think about what the curriculum looks like for math. Um, I think that's happening at the discipline level more than it's happening at the governmental level. And I believe that may be a reflection on the um, the demise of the nation state and the individual communities that are springing up based around common interests or topics. Um, 
I, we are running out of time. Um, I want to make sure that um, I put my email address out here so that you can contact me if you want uh, um, copies of the data, if you want uh, any, any way to follow up. You may do that with my email, which is george.saltzman at lamar.edu. Um, want to uh, thank you for your participation, especially your comments and the chat window. This was very good to be able to see uh, your comments rolling through. It makes me feel like I'm connected with you in some way and that we're sharing something that's, that's of similar interest. Um, I, I am a little disappointed that I couldn't get to hear each of your stories because I know in, a, in an organization like this, in a conference like this, you have so many great experiences individually and collectively. It is, it is the most amazing group of people that you could put together on a planet. Um, <laughs> or it does go by quickly. Um, um, thank you very, very much. And uh, I hope to meet you in person somewhere around the world soon. If uh, not in Tahiti, then uh, wherever you are. Thank you very, very much.